The following program is brought to you in part by the film Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace. Welcome to another Leon China Report. We have a really eclectic and exciting show tonight. Well, Supersonas is actually a collaboration of uh, two names, two words, Super and Personas. And the name actually personifies uh, the wide range of professional women who are part of our ongoing community. And, and we added the super because we really wanted to stand out and not just blend in with personas. So we figured it's going to differentiate us from other personas. Supersonas uh, is a social organization. It's a movement, and it's a fast-growing community. Uh, which is aimed uh, to uh, promote gender equality, gender balance in decision-making uh, junctions and influential junctions in Israel and worldwide. And uh, it all began uh, a year ago. Today, earlier, I was reading the newspaper, and uh, in the business section, I read an article about um, uh, a board of one of Israel's leading companies, and the board members are 13, and there are only one woman on the board. Something is very, very wrong. And then she told me an, of another thing she uh, uh, found in the newspaper about a seminar held in one of Israel's top universities where none of the speakers in the seminar were women. Something is not working, and we are 50% of the population. We have to do something about it. We have to make change. I want to do something. Are you coming along? There's a law in Israel. The regulation says it has to be one woman on the board. And back to the stories that, the, like Galit was saying, we, we have a friend of mine who, uh, who went to a friend, was on several boards, and she finished her, uh, her, uh, her tenure in one of the boards. And she went to a friend of hers who was a CEO of one of the large companies. He says, you know, I'm available now. Do you have any board positions uh, in your, in your um, director? And he says, yes, but we already have a woman. All of the research has then shows that if there are a proportional amount of women on the board, then it uh, impacts the bottom line. It doesn't have to be proportional. If you go from zero women on the board to three women on the board, then the, the, uh, from the research of 22,000 companies in 91 different countries, going from zero uh, percent women on the board to 30 percent women on the board, is a 15 percent increase in profits in the bottom line. So it's not just because it's the right thing to do, it's because it's the, the economic thing to do. Well, a funny story started with the uh, World Cricket Association where that decided that women have to be on boards. So I kind of joined a, a, a board because it was an incentive. Uh, it turned out after a while that the men were sort of between themselves and then they came up to me telling me that it's actually quite a great idea to have a woman on board. We believe in the power of collaboration. We, we don't think that we're better and in that respect we're not classic feminists. We believe in the togetherness and, and bringing together our forces and growing companies I think in, in, in is, is a better future for everyone involved. I would think that in Israel, because it was so innovative, they would be a bit different here in Israel than in the rest of the world. Uh, but I was, I was looking at some research done by Deloitte, and I found that each country, in all of the European countries and all of the American countries, it's about the same. There will be some that will 15, there will be some that will 19, 20 percent, but it ranges between 15 and 20 percent, and it's kind of uh, very old-fashioned. 
Um, the majority of the women in supersonas are women that have already passed the glass ceiling. They, uh, they were able to advance and get ahead without needing a supersona organization to help them get past it. And I think the important thing for these women, including myself, is that we were able to, in spite of the fact that we were women, we want to help the remainder of the, of the population, the, very, the qualified. We want to help them get through the glass <coughs> ceiling the way that we were able to, and, and for it not to be an issue anymore. Um, the majority of the women that I work with on the board unit, this, they all say the same thing. Is all of our lives, most of our careers, we've gone through and we've been the only women in the room. I'm used to it. Most of us are used to it. But it shouldn't be that way. And actually, it's not economical to be that way. I'd like to talk about the misconceptions about uh, women as keynote speakers and women's on, uh, women on panels. Uh, the misconception is that women don't want to speak. They don't want to speak up. And the truth behind this misconception is that conference uh, organizers, uh, they approach the same 10 women every time, time after time after time. But the question is, what about all the other thousands of women who are professionals, who have a track record, who uh, have uh, inter entrepreneurship experience, uh, who have public speaking experience, why are they not approached? And we decided to launch a website, uh, and this website would include uh, women with uh, professional uh, experience, uh, managerial experience, entrepreneurship experience, uh, public speaking experience, uh, proven track record, and each woman receives her own page, and on that page uh, there is uh, a personal statement, uh, there is uh, information about her professional experience, information about her education, and uh, some information about the topics she would like to address and how she would like to create an impact. And we launched this website on uh, March 8th, uh, 2015, which was the International Women's Day uh, one year ago, with 100 women. And today we have 1,000 women. I want to say something that I think it's correct for all of us. We love men. We love men. We enjoy working together with men. We have nothing against the men, and I think that's what makes us different from the other women's organizations. We, uh, we believe in, like, like Netta said, we believe in collaboration. And I think that the, a board that would have all women wouldn't be, wouldn't be good at all, a board with all, just as a board with all men. The, the togetherness, the working together, that's what's important. Well, you know, in, in today's world, volatility is a new norm. And, uh, and I, I, I say chaos is a new normal. This is what is a great opportunity, is the way I see it. And managing risk is mission critical, but so is managing chance. And in today's world where, you know, logic is out, magic is in, I'm a strategic magic uh, executive here with us, um, putting together strategic enterprises, global enterprises work to work with us. And the pace of how it happens and the way of how it happens and, you know, the world is sick. We went viral. Things are happening fast. In less than a year, we grew to 1,000 people. We had uh, a conference where a Fortune magazine uh, journalist came and, and talked about supersonas. World uh, Facebook global uh, headquarters saw it offered us a platform which is called Facebook at Work. They, they only offer to 300 organizations worldwide and we're the first social enterprise who's actually using it. No, 300 paid for it. We're the only one oh, who bought of it. Of course, as a of present. course. <laughs> and this is chance because chance is, is, is becoming um, in, in a way a capital. This is, this is what makes us grow, become wealthy, uh, you know, fortune, fortune is, is created using innovation, using creativity, using one of the most important things we have is a sense of belonging of our community, uh, the outreach to the world, and the world is reaching out to us. So I'm going to take the opportunity, since you asked the question about chance, to say that if people are watching us and want to join us and want to partner, want to create opportunities together, um, have creative ways of, of creating the impact together, we're inviting them 
we're inviting them at supersonas.com. They can find all the contact information. After uh, uh, they wrote the article about us in Fortune magazine, and we were also uh, mentioned in the United Nations in Geneva, we understood that we're doing something uh, of global importance, and as such, it must be addressed globally. So a few uh, weeks ago, uh, we successfully launched Supersonas New York, and we are approached by uh, representatives of other countries uh, who take a lot of interest in what we're doing and want to join hands and, and, uh, and open other representatives in, in, in other places in the world. We are not a feminist movement. We but we are feminists. But we are feminists. We like the men who are feminist. And as women, we, we preach for um, a gender balance. So in other words, we, we, we totally understand that there's certain organizations where women, where women take over. For instance, teachers. Um, they probably amount 80% in, in Israel if you look at the numbers. We also understand that in the military, and Israel is a, com is, is a country that has to defend itself, there are more men. That's fine. But we, we, we totally see leadership as a joint venture. In, in the military, of course, you also have to have the, the, the strategic discussions. And uh, there's, much there's much more other than the, the boys that are fighting. And the women in the strategic positions are very relevant. Um, and, and Absolutely. I think that, uh, you met the lady that, that uh, teaches the generals. Exactly. Right. We, have, we have women teaching generals how to become generals. Wow. Because we bring a fresh perspective. Because we bring things that are, are common sense, but they're not so common anymore. And if you take women out of the boardroom or if you create an event and the keynote speakers are, are men, then you're, you're lacking a lot of potential to bring fresh ideas and, new, and, and interesting perspectives, and diversity is important. Absolutely. And there are, there are uh, a lot of women who expertise in, uh, in the military issues. We have, for example, Dr. Anat hochbeld Marom, who is an ISIS uh, specialist. She knows a lot of things that nobody else knows, and she should be a part of the relevant discussions concerning ISIS. It's the same all over the world. The same in, in, in both situations, that women are lacking in the top positions, and women bring, bring value to the top positions. And once you bring them in, it's the same in all The research I've been following is from global, all over the global world. companies. Um, the bigger the company, the more important it is. And um, it's, a, it's a common issue. It's not an issue specific to any one economy. It's an issue that's, uh, that's worldwide. I think it's a global issue. I want to mention one more thing about the feminism. We're here for our daughters and for our sons. We, want, we believe that we can make a better world once the, we're more, the women are involved as they should be. And so it's not, it's not just a women's issue. It's like Netta said, it's a human issue. We take a look at the um, performance of VCs who invest and take a look at the investments made by women, five times better. You take a look at um, companies where, as Narkis mentioned, there are more than three board members who are uh, women, their bottom line is much better. Uh, you take a look at um, conferences where, where women are keynote speakers. speakers, not just keynote listeners. There's a lot of, of beautiful ideas coming out of there, and there's a lot of impact that is created by women. The problem is, and this is an old problem, we're addressing it with new tools. The problem is that, one, there was no platform that was actually a pool of all these top-notch women. So that's the first thing we created. The second thing was uh, awareness and regulation. And even though there is regulation, we'd prefer that men start to understand <coughs> that it actually to their benefit and to the company's benefit to include women. So go for uh, panelists and conferences, etc. The third thing that we're addressing, and it's, a, it's an issue worldwide, is that men and women don't make the same salaries. Women make 30% less. less for doing the exact same job 
in the exact same hours. And you know what we realized? That women underestimate their power, underestim underestimate their values, and it's easy to pay them less because they're not asking for more. So one of the most important things we feel we're responsible for is education and something we call empowerment, which is a little different than just empowerment. Many women um, <laughs> don't understand their value and so underestimate themselves, and so they don't put themselves out there to be the speakers, to be on the boardrooms, even though they, they are perfectly capable and qualified. And um, one of the things that we believe is, is our purpose is to encourage them to speak up. If I, if I look at the building blocks of Supersonas and the way we see our DNA growing, we have a big asset, which is the community, and that's our main asset. And it's, 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 a, it's a new job created in the last 10 years or so, a community that is also viral and, and actual. Um, it needs a lot of TLC because it's a closed group. Right. And uh, the uh, mother, <laughs> I, I should call, I should say, of all the, the women in the community, the growing community, is Galit, who, who makes sure she knows that each person um, talks to each person, knows them by name, profession, and as we start collaborating, we, we have our inner circle, and then we have two other circles. We have the professional circle, which is managed by Nalkis, and the board unit is, is, is the execution uh, wing, and then we have uh, the business sector, and the global world is part of that. That's how we see it. So we're growing simultaneously. We're growing the community, which is the main asset. We're growing our agenda through our professional services and our recognition worldwide because we'd like to join forces and create an impact for women all over the world. We're back with Toya Moshe Aarons, who is the former, wow, we gotta go through this, uh, ambassador from Israel to Washington, MIT graduate, three-time defense minister, how many times foreign minister? Once. Once foreign minister. Any other ministries? No. Very, enough, very, enough. very, very staunch supporter of the Lavi project, which uh, never really got its way, uh, correct? The Lavi project was a special plane. Unfortunately, it, canceled it, big, mis big mistake. It was canceled. Mm -hmm. Do you find an anachronism that Shimon Peres is sitting in the same cabinet as uh, Yvette Lieb I mean, uh, Lieberman? Does that look a little f funny to you? Well, first of all, I find it uh, worse than anachronism, uh, something distasteful, that Lieberman sits in the cabinet. I don't like his ideas. Uh, look, I don't have to like everybody's ideas, a different opinion, but uh, his ideas about how to deal with, uh, with the Arabs. Are they racist, basically? Well, they're certainly not democratic, and if he wants to strip Israeli, Israeli Arab citizens of their citizenship, that's not, uh, that, that would not pass in any democratic country in the world. Now, he comes from the former Soviet Union, maybe uh, they still need some time to absorb basic uh, democratic principles. So, uh, and and uh, this is a mistake I think that Olmert made, again, here strictly for political reasons. He wanted to reinforce the coalition, so he brought in a party that had uh, 11 members of the Knesset. Uh, almost uh, saying, I don't, I don't care who this party is, I don't care who this Lieberman is, just as long as I get more votes in the Knesset. Uh, but Shimon Peres and he in, in policy are diametrically opposed. Well, Sh Shimon Peres... Uh, What's your relationship with Peres, by the way? Well, we're on good terms. We know each other for... Uh, 50 many, years. Many, many years, yes. Uh, 50 years? Maybe 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think that Shimon Peres uh, would be prepared to sit in almost any government as long as it's a position that ha has respect with it, has honor with it. I, I just heard him the other day, he was uh, interviewed and people asked him, how do you like being number two? Because after all, he's a man who, who thinks of himself as number one. And uh, this is a typical Shimon answer. He says, you know what, what it means to be number two? It means that we are two. And two is better than one. See? <laughs> he's a very bright guy, by the way. Shimon well, Peretz. Yeah, he wouldn't have gotten he, where he is unless he, he was he's bright. He's a yeah. very, very smart guy. and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but he, he doesn't give up, and, and for his age, he's very vibrant, and I think he's ready to become the president of Israel if Katsav No is doubt about it, he's ready, ready to become president of Israel. I think he's uh, 84, 85 years old. Uh, God but, bless. Uh, he doesn't look it, and he's active. Uh, Does he have a chance to become president, in your opinion? 
Uh, you know, it's not like the election for president in the United States. I know. The election, the election, <laughs> I know. election <laughs> takes place in the Knesset. Right. right. Which is a small... And secret vote. 100, 120 people. Well, secret vote, yes, but you know, now the uh, Paris and uh, Olmert, Olmert is... They uh, want to make an open vote. They want to make an open vote. And uh, the most uh, curious arguments are being advanced as to why there should be an open vote, because on the ha on, it seems to me, uh, when you look at it at face value, a secret ballot is better. But uh, why should the people in the Knesset vote the way the party tells them to vote about who the president is going to be? Why shouldn't they vote their conscience? And maybe if it's an open vote, they, they won't feel that they can. Their, their head of the party is going to tell them, we want you to all vote for Paris. But uh, they're advancing arguments saying that an open vote is uh, more, that democratic. A, more democratic than a closed vote. And why should you allow people to hide their opinion? Why shouldn't the public know exactly who they're voting for? So they're still arguing about that now. I spoke to uh, uh, the Prime Minister, Arak Sharon. At that time, I was lobbying for a vote of Asa to become president of Israel. Arak said to me, absolutely no problem, absolutely no problem. And somehow, everything is not that secret. <laughs> People find out at the end. And Arak did not vote for Asa. Now, one of our... But Omar did. Uh, Omar did, for yeah. sure. Um, Ruby Riblin, who's been on his show about 150 times and is a staunch Likudnik, has announced that he wants to uh, become the president of Israel. Does he have a chance, uh, Moshe? Yeah, as a matter of fact, they say he's the front runner uh, right now. And uh, the assumption is, I don't know if it's correct or not, that uh, the only way Paris could win is if it is an open vote, which means that the parties would control the vote of the party representatives in the Knesset. There was a rumor that Rabbi Lau wanted to run for the presidency. Well, he's been sort of a uh, black horse candidate, and I guess he would take it if he uh, could get How it. How do you think that would work for a rabbi? I mean, basically, the rabbi couldn't shake the hand of Condoleezza Rice, or could a rabbi be president of Israel? It would be an interesting uh, play there, wouldn't mm -hmm. it, a religious leader? Well, well I, I don't know what uh, Rabbi Lau, uh, Lau's uh, protocol is about uh, handshaking. Uh, I don't think he would shake the yeah, hand yeah, of all. I don't think so. Well, that, uh, that might be a little bit of a problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa couldn't come over. <laughs> all right. Iraq, you're a defense minister and you're an intelligent man. Can the United States come out of this? Should they have gone in, in your opinion? And uh, this is only your personal opinion. What do you think? Well, first of all, you know, I'm. I'm I would be very careful about Monday morning quarterbacking and not looking back and saying you should have, should not. And secondly, uh, I'm really, I don't have access to all the information. I, I'm not uh, an American uh, former Secretary of Defense. I'm an Israeli former uh, Minister of Defense. Uh, I really wouldn't uh, have very high regard for my opinions uh, in the matter. I think what is clear is that uh, the decision to go into Iraq made by President Bush and, and his advisors was made under circumstances where they did not really know what they were getting into. And uh, I've said uh, to people, there's an Arabic expression, uh, ba'adain. Ba'adain means afterwards. That's a common expression in Arabic. You tell somebody a story and, and he will then respond, and afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I said, well, maybe that's something that Bush had said after he was given the plans for Iraq. He might have said, and afterwards? <laughs> well, where do we go from there? And, uh, well, he, he didn't know Iraq. I guess he didn't ask that question. And nobody, I think that question was never really uh, considered in the kind of detail that maybe it should have been. All right. The, uh, this war and its effect on Israel, has it any effect whatsoever right now? Uh, look, uh, Israel, I think generally, when I say Israel in this case, uh, most of the Israeli public, I think we're very supportive of President Bush's policy. Right. Because he dealt with a man who was a deadly enemy of the state of Israel, Saddam Hussein, and a man who had launched Scud missiles against Israel, and uh, who might launch who knows what right. at some future date. Right. And who had sent expeditionary forces against Israel in, in past wars. So that, that enemy, in effect, was eliminated. And from the Israeli uh, point of view, it's a, this is a net gain. And, and I think it is a net gain. Uh, how this thing develops from now on, who takes over in Iraq if the United States leaves, uh, if this is perceived in the Arab world as a defeat of the United States, an ally of, of, uh, of Israel. Well, that would not be possible. That's that would true. not be not Syria. 
I told you a couple of generals, ex-generals came to my office this week. They were just espousing the idea that Israel should talk to Syria. Uh, what's your opinion? The opposite. It just goes to show you, see, civilians don't have the same opinion as the generals. Right. And maybe more, more of the time the civilians are right rather than the generals. Look, the uh, Syrians assume that in any negotiations with Israel, the first thing that would happen would, would be that Israel would give up the Golan Heights. Now, Israel's been in control of the Golan Heights for uh, how long now? 40 years? We have 20,000 Israelis living uh, on, the, on the Golan Heights. We've lost hundreds of our soldiers in the fighting on the Golan Heights in defending ourselves against the Syrians. The Syrians attacked Israel three times. That's how they lost the Golan Heights. I don't believe that an aggressor nation if it loses a war, should have that whatever territory they lose return to it. That's certainly not the case with Germany after, war, after World War II. It's not the case with Japan after World War II. As a matter of fact, it's unprecedented, except for one president that I know that you supported, namely when Begin gave the Egyptians who had attacked us three times, lost three times, and got back everything they lost. So I, I, don't, I don't believe in that. I, I don't believe in, in uh, creating that kind of incentives to aggressive nations. And secondly, and not, not less importantly, we are an ally of the United States. Uh, we did abandon one ally. The SLA, of course, is a big difference. We need South Lebanese army in the United States, you know. But still, it was an ally, and it was the wrong thing to do. Now, we are an ally of the United States. The, the position of the U.S. government is that you should not negotiate with Syria at the present time. Now, we should just disregard that. You know, be uh, the big strong guy that says we don't care what the United States says, uh, we do what's good for Israel. Sounds good, right? First time around. Not so good, not so smart. So at the present time, the position of the U.S. government is that uh, Israel should not negotiate with Israel, uh, with uh, Syria. I think we should respect that position and just take that subject off the table, regardless of what these generals told you. What do you think about talking to Iran? What are we going to talk to them about? They want to wipe us off the map. Convince them that they shouldn't do it? <laughs> the United States, I mean, not, not Israel. Oh, the United States. Well, I think it depends on the circumstances, it depends on what's, uh, what's being Are talked about. Are you worried about the uh, nuclearization of Iran? Well, sure, and I think everybody should be worried about it, and uh, I think most people in the world are worried about it. Shimon Peres, I read, thinks that they're a paper tiger. They really don't have a good uh, army and air force, etc. cetera. Huh? Uh, do, you, do you believe the same? Well, look, the subject that uh, we're concerned about right now is ir uh, Iran with a nuclear weapon. Nuclear, right. And that would be a great danger, even if you said, uh, look, their army is not much of an army, their air force is not much of an army, of uh, an air force, but uh, if they can put it on the top of a missile and they press the button, like Saddam said, uh, uh, Hussein did in the Gulf War, uh, the world could be in serious trouble. So you've got to be concerned about that. All right, the headline in the newspapers this morning is that uh, uh, the Fatah and the Hamas made a deal at Mecca, mm. their holy city. Do you believe that this deal will last? I doubt it. I mean, there, there's anarchy over there. there now. I believe it's, it's uh, a civil war. It's very, yeah, well, it's close to civil war. It is a civil war. They're, they're killing each other. Children are getting, getting killed. People who have no involvement in either of these organizations are, are getting hurt. It's, it's a demonstration, unfortunately, I think for everybody, especially for the Palestinians, that they just can't run their own show. And all this talk about uh, a Palestinian state and uh, uh, side by side and the uh, state of Israel and the state of the Palestinians, good for everybody, I think it's not in the cards. So what would ultimately happen with Gaza? What do you think will happen there? They'll just blow each other up? I mean, what, something will happen. The, the Europeans will come in. Something has to happen. We, look, if somebody the really world can't allow that to happen. Well, look, if somebody really cared then they would care about the fact that in Gaza you today have a million and a half uh, Palestinians, uh, the vast majority of them refugees living under terrible conditions, and you would think that uh, countries that are concerned would say, can we take some of these refugees? Can we get them out of that hellhole? Can we resettle them somewhere? Nobody's saying that. But that's and, been and perennial, hasn't it? That's been perennial, and, and it's not changed, and it's an indication that a lot of the stock is really not uh, really, uh, uh, does not really consider the fate of the people living there. Because the fate of the people living there, first thing that that requires is that you get some of them out of there. 
uh, Moshe Aaron's, uh, one thing he's known for is truth and wisdom. So you may not agree with everything he says, but he tells it to you the way he sees it, and he's very truthful. And uh, I would say most people in the, in the world, or most people in Israel, admire him for that. So we'll be right back. We can say to the Palestinians that more or less a quota of the same number of people who stay in your country will be invited to Israel. Palestinians who are citizens of Palestine will be allowed to Israel as residents, as permanent residents, but not as, as, a, as a citizens and voters. So in my view, this kind of an arrangement can be done perhaps only under an umbrella of a confederation. Because in a confederation you can justify special treatment to a very clear segment of foreigners. Israelis will have uh, some kind of an advantage in Palestine and Palestinians will have some kind of advantage in, in Israel. And, and, and the demographic problem will not be a burden because the Palestinians who will live here, if they wish so, will not, uh, will not have uh, the, the right to vote for the Knesset, but to the Palestinian uh, uh, parliament. Well, the, the number today is that outside of Jerusalem, and I believe that Jerusalem, the, the Jewish neighborhoods in Jerusalem will become part of Israel, recognized by the world. We will have to divide East Jerusalem and to give up on the Arab neighborhoods there. So the problem is not Jerusalem itself, but the the terrorists, the the, the the West the West Bank, the territories. I believe that Ariel will not be part of Israel. My Adomim will be part of Israel. This is according to the Geneva Initiative, but maybe it will be different. Today you are having there about 350,000 uh, settlers. I believe that a significant number of them will, be, will become Israeli citizens who live in Israel under the Israeli law so that the new border will include them. And then you make your life easier. So you will have something between 100,000 to 200,000 that should be evacuated if we don't adopt my solution. This is very difficult. It is still very difficult. The numbers are now, I mean, between 100 and 200,000 are not the same uh, numbers of, that people are speaking about, but still it is problematic. And I believe that if, if you agree to some kind of a, a confederation which will allow them to be non-Israeli residents, but Palestinian residents there, we can, we can really solve a very, very heavy problem of the, of the settlements. There will be very clear res uh, residents of Palestine, permanent residents of Palestine with all the rights of permanent residents and cit citizens of Israel. They will pay uh, taxes to the Palestinians if they work in Palestine. You are asking me whether I can see Israelis actually remaining there under the Palestinian law. From this you can learn that they will have to pay taxes, they will be, find, they find the, the themselves in prison if they are doing something wrong and things like that. If you ask me, I would not recommend to them to do that. I mean, I, I am not trying to convince them to stay in Palestine. I just want, don't want to confront them. And I'm saying to them, most of you will not stay there. Will not stay there because of your kids, because of your parents, because of many other things. You will not uh, be ready to, to, to live in a country which is not necessarily too democratic and whatever. Why should you? But you should decide, not me. And if you believe that the, the land is more important for you than the state, which many of them are saying to me, then live there. Why, why do I need to, to send my granddaughters to take you out of your homes? With all due respect, they should do other things in the army. Gaza is a very, very big problem that we are facing. And with Gaza, I believe that the practical solution, which I hope is not impossible, 
is to have with them what they could, uh, what they call hudna, or a kind of armistice for for a limited time of 10, 15 years. I don't see Hamas playing part in the PLO game. I'm afraid that Abu Mazen is exaggerating when he says that if he signs an agreement with Israel, they will follow. I don't think that they will follow Abu Mazen. And they will actually criticize any agreement that he will sign with us because any agreement is a compromise and they don't want any compromise. Like the rightists in Israel will, com will uh, criticize any agreement which will be signed with Abu Mazen. So, since they are not ready to be part of the game, regretfully, I, I think that we should not leave the situation as is, but try to have with them a hood. Now, I believe, I, I hope, let us say, that once we find a solution with the Palestinians, and we solve the issues of Jerusalem, and there is free access to Haram Sharif and whatever, it would be possible for them to say, okay, since you already have a permanent uh, border with uh, the West Bank, since the religious problem has been solved, since we are not ready to recognize you, despite of all of it, and we believe that you should not bid here as a state, but realistically we understand that you are wrong, you are strong for, for a while and that we have to take you into account. So we will sign with you some kind of a hudna. It is not a perfect solution, but this is the solution that I believe should be there until there is another leadership in, in Gaza, which is wise enough to understand that uh, for the benefit of their own people, the best thing is to have peace with Israel. And once they have peace with Israel, then there will be a safe passage between Gaza and the West Bank, something which I cannot see as long as Gaza is not part of our game. Many Palestinians tell me that in their view, there is no better solution than a confederation of a two-state of, of a two-state solution. It is not contradictory to the two states. It is not a substitute to the two states, but this is a kind of an addition to it. And I always uh, remember what uh, the late Faisal Husseini, the Palestinian leader of Jerusalem, um, what he said to me about the, the issue of the uh, Confederation. And he said to me, if I'm really speaking in the interest of my people, which means having a better economic situation and having a democracy, it is much more important for us to have a confederation with you. And don't be misled by the current animosity. We want freedom, we want sovereignty. You are the occupier. It is impossible to have very good relations. You, have, you can have human relations, but there is resentment on our side, but it doesn't mean that we don't appreciate you. And I think that Jordan can be, at a certain uh, time, part of this uh, kind of a confederation. But uh, the idea of Israeli-Palestinian confederation is something which is very tempting to the Palestinians. You know, I cannot say that Abu Mazen is adopting it or, or, or opposing it. I can say that uh, this is something that eventually I will not raise publicly or, or politically if I don't have Palestinian support for it. All what I did was always to suggest ideas with the Palestinians. Even when I published my article about the Confederation in the New York Times, which triggered reactions later on, and a very important research which is done right now in Chatham House in London, I did it only after talking to my Palestinian counterpart, knowing that something like that would interest them. Confederation is something which is a political scientist label 
something which doesn't exist anywhere in the world. There are only two countries in the world right now which call themselves confederations, which are Switzerland and Canada, and none of them is a confederation. Both of them are federations, like the United States. So the, the idea of a confederation is implemented, in my view, only in one place, which doesn't call itself confederation, and this is the, Uni the, the European Union. My, my model is the, is the EU. Of course, not one-to-one, -one, but generally speaking, keeping your sovereignties and decide yourself which authorities you want to handle uh, to the uh, United uh, uh, Authority. Uh, I, I think that it's, it proves itself, although it is very difficult to keep it. Every day you have to, to be sure that everybody is on board. But uh, 28 uh, uh, countries with veto power is not two countries uh, with veto power. And I hope that something like this can be relevant. But I don't want now to use, just to use the, the name confederation and to go on. I want to study the matter. It might take us about a year and a half. We have been patient uh, until now in order to get the book of the Confederation, to see why there is no other Confederation in the world, why Confederations which were there, uh, like in former Yugoslavia, uh, failed, and, uh, and, and to see whether this is something that we can really suggest. But I, I believe that uh, something like, the, like this will not be against uh, the idea of anybody who supports the two-state solution. One, once you are against the two-state solution, I don't believe that you will support a confederation between the two-state solution that you are against. But once you, are, you say this is the solution, so the idea of a confederation is not something which might uh, uh, dilute anything of, the, of Israel as a state, and, and uh, as a result of it, I don't think that anybody who supports it will be against it. The Israeli Arabs do not have a real dilemma between Israel and Palestine. They want very much that the conflict will end. They want very much that there will be a Palestinian state, but they don't want to be part of this Palestinian state. I didn't hear people who said to me, at least, that once there is peace, they would choose the Palestinian state and, and be citizens there. If they do that, by the way, nobody will hold them. But I don't think that there is any such a problem. What they are saying is that this is our people. We identify with the Palestinian people. And we want that they will be happy and that they will, be ha they will have their own uh, state. Once they have their state, we finished our job. I mean, we are trying to push and to convince to go for peace and to have a Palestinian state. But that's it. I do not see the Israeli electorate and the Israeli leadership going to the, to the right. The, the fact that we are now having the, the most rightist government in Israel ever is not a result of a shift in the, in the public opinion, but as a result of Netanyahu's preferences for a coalition. Such a government could have been uh, established in the past, but usually the rightist uh, leaders did not want to have a very rightist government. They always wanted others to join them. And this is perhaps the first government which is only a, a rightist. But if you see the changes which happened in the Israeli society, you see the following trend. And this is not a trend to the right necessarily. The staunch hawks of Israel, most of them, the leaders, changed their minds and spoke openly about the two-state solution, understanding that otherwise, demographically, there will not be a Jewish state anymore. And there is no situation whereby a minority of Jews is dominating a majority of Arabs in the West Bank, Israel, and Gaza. Gaza indirectly. This is why Sharon, the icon of the Hawks, 
spoke about uh, 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 the, the idea of the two-state solution and uh, evacuated Gaza. And this is why Netanyahu decided a few years ago to deliver his famous uh, speech about the two-state solution. And he says, even if it is a lip service, but a lip service is something important because lip service gives you the zeitgeist, gives you the, the, the feeling, the, the mood of the, of the time, of the epoch. If you think that the zeitgeist is for two-state solution and you want to lead the people, you say two-state solution. And this means that we, the, the peace camp in Israel, was successful to convince the, the, a, a very important group of the sons of the leaders of the Likud, Dan Merido, Tzipi Livni, uh, Roni Milo, many others who are uh, now in the late 50s, the early 60s, that the two-state solution is the only solution.